All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 11th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. I notice my voice sounds a little strange. I have a lingering cold and uh, cough, so it might interrupt me. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, today, you know, I, I, I pray that, that some Christian apologists that have wandered far afield, like James White, would return to defending the faith and get focused on the real issue. Today, they're too concerned about the enemies outside the gate or the enemies at the gate of the church. No, they should be more concerned about the enemies within the gates, inside the church, inside what's called the visible church. As... I've been doing, had stumbled across by the will of God uh, the fact that one of the most uh, well-known, well, I don't know, maybe he is the theologian of the Nazarenes, I don't know, it's the closest thing I could find, is an absolute heretic, both on his understanding of God and especially on his understanding of the cross. Uh, this, without the cross, without penal substitutionary atonement, in other words, without believing that Jesus Christ bore my punishment on the cross in my place, and by that atoned for my sins, that I might be ex made acceptable to God, and that... Uh, justified before God by faith. Without that, you're not a Christian. You don't have anything. There's no, Christianity is meaningless without that. It's just another dead religion. If, 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 if the, when they talk about why Christ died, if it's nonsense, if it's anything other than Christ died, on our behalf for our sins, taking our place, died a substitutionary death, a vicarious death, and then rose again, demonstrating both who he is and the fact that he actually did atone for our sins. See, if our sin was indeed counted to him, bore by him, if he had not fully atoned for it, acceptably before God, to himself, because he is God, too. See, here's, here's something that they'll often, these people, these liars, will often do. They'll, they'll, they'll pick, how could God punish an innocent person? It was God himself on the cross also. <sighs> Let's take a look at something here to start with, the scriptures. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. This is the Apostle Paul who had gathered the elders together and sort of given them last instructions. He says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood. See, there's, there's, it doesn't say Jesus. It doesn't say Christ. It says 
the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Jesus is God. So it was God in Christ reconciling to the world to himself on the cross. God became flesh and dwelt among us. This is one of those cases, if you don't have the Trinity, this don't work. See, any, any kind of pure monotheism, pure as in like oneness theology where God just puts on different masks, pretends to be this and pretends to be that, or becomes this and becomes that, but he's not. There is no trying unity. It doesn't work. You get all these stupid questions like, well, here you got God praying to God. Yeah, because God's a trinity. One God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is, uh, the Son is praying to the Father. Not a problem for the Trinitarians. Problem for everybody else. Why? What's he saying right here? So God purchased the church with his own blood. So in cosmic child abuse, God satisfied his own justice upon himself. God took on flesh. Became a man. Isn't that what it says in John chapter 1? And then in the beginning the Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word pre-existing. It's in, uh, let's see, the, the imperfect form of the, of the Greeks. That means that it's the background. In the, in the beginning, the Word was already. doesn't say the Word began. Jehovah's Witnesses. And the word was with God, pros God. Face to face is the way I'd probably render it. It's toward. The two the father and the son were face to face. And the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. All right, so here you have God in the Son, as the Son, purchasing the church with his own blood. Verse 29, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And also from among you, from among yourselves, men, among your own selves, you elders, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. He goes on, but that's for my purpose right now. That is sufficient. Savage wolves will come in among you, and from among yourselves perverse men will arise to draw away disciples after themselves. The church is full of savage wolves and perverse men today. And we're going to look for a moment at one, and another denier of the cross of Jesus Christ. A man named David Bentley Hart. A little bit like an N.T. Wright, except he left the Anglicans, the High Anglicans, which is the Anglo-Catholic sort of, uh, in order to become a, an Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox. Probably because in Eastern Orthodoxy, almost anything goes. I mean, it, it is so amorphous. 
he's a universalist and an avowed uh, socialist. I was going to say Marxist, but no, there's a difference. Marxism is a form of socialism. Uh, during the 19th century, the uh, especially toward the latter end, uh, Christian socialism was all the rage, including in the United States. You know the guy, the, the, the Baptist that wrote the Pledge of Allegiance? Socialist. Just thought you might want to know that. Next time you say it, uh, I will not repeat the Pledge of Allegiance because my allegiance is, I, I, am, I have been given, I've been purchased by someone. I am not my own man. I belong to Jesus Christ. And my allegiance is to him, to my Lord and Savior, my God and my King. I am not free to give my allegiance to another. That would be treason. Especially, I'm not going to pledge allegiance to a government that is headed by uh, Uncle Joe. That would be like pledging my allegiance to Uncle Joe Stalin. No difference. No difference. No moral distinction between the two. Not in my book. Not in God's book. They're both murderers, thieves, robbers utterly amoral uh, and but I don't think Stalin was in favor of abortion he wanted to be have more Russians yeah you you could get a medal from the Soviet Union for burying a lot of children women got medals heroes of the Soviet Union for having you know I don't know seven eight nine children they, I uh, think abortion was legal, but it certainly was not encouraged by the state. Huh. Unlike the, the current character in the White House who is going around the world trying to coerce countries to promote, to legalize and promote abortion and all other kinds of death-dealing vices. You notice that, that the current fads in the United States, they are all dealers of death, giving children gender-neutering pills, destroying their bodies. Physicians, you know, there used to be the Hippocratic Oath, and there's something in that oath that says, above all, do no harm. You're not Physicians not permitted to, to do things like euthanasia or abortion that was prohibited. See, the ancient Greeks knew that. But this country has gone morally, well, into the abyss. A don't put your trust in Donald Trump because he can't save America. He is part of the, of the problem. He is morally corrupt, too. If you haven't noticed... I mean, he's, uh, he could have run, you know, Donald Trump could have run as a Democrat. Could have. Might, have. might have won as a Democrat. Wouldn't that have been a strange sh shift in history? What would, he might be, still be president today. But what would he be doing? I don't know. Oh, they would have applauded him. Can you imagine with all the uh, the his his uh, bringing peace between some of the countries in the Middle East? Can you imagine if he was a Democrat? What how different it would have been? The the result the, the response. Oh, he definitely would have Nobel Prize. Prize was up the wazoo if he had been a Democrat. And he wasn't a Republican either. No, he was like, drain the swamp. He saw the swamp for what it was. 
but he didn't realize how strong it was. His, his ego, see, Donald Trump failed, I believe, in part, this just occurred to me, because of his ego. He thought he could do it, that he was strong enough in himself to drain the swamp. Well, he went out there in the swamp, and the swamp ate him. Jurassic Park, you know, the guy that goes out there by himself with a shotgun against the 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 rapt, uh, velociraptors. That was stupid. Against a herd of super predators. No, you don't do that. Never, ever do that. They will get you. <laughs> like, it, it applies to human beings, too. No, you don't go out in an area where you don't have good visibility, especially, and you can't see 360 <laughs> with a shotgun. Not that a shotgun wouldn't kill them, but probably not fast enough. Uh, no, that's like, well, like, it's like elephants. Think of hunting elephants. You have to put them down immediately. They're, they're, you can't. They're, they're a very small target that you have to hit. Uh, you have to hit their brain. Because if you don't put them down instantly, they'll kill you. While they're dying, they will kill you. Uh, they're big and powerful animals. It's the same thing. Any, any, you know, like uh, lions and things like that. No, no, no. Or, or African or American brown bears, or grizzlies, or anything like that. You, you don't even even uh, deer and. And elk and things are deadly if they're wounded. They can kill you with those horns. A wounded animal is a very dangerous thing. How did I get on that? I don't know. Stream of consciousness, I guess. All right, so... Here we have, you know, the substitution. Uh, the, Paul is dis distinctly saying that God purchased the church with his own blood. And again, if you don't have a Trinitarian understanding of God, it doesn't work, does it? See, the Jews, that would really disgust them. They are strict monotheism. Even though God uses both singular and plural in, result, uh, in regard to himself in Genesis, the first chapter. different doctrine though here right here but it's, it's related because uh, in the atonement God is not pun he's taking the punishment upon himself he is bearing the cost of reconciling human beings upon his own being I could say person but so it, it is not like he's punishing a, an innocent bystander. No. I mean, the, the, see, these, these people that that uh, attack the Trinity, they don't want to under, and attack the gospel, because this is the gospel. Penal substitutionary atonement is the gospel. Without that, there is no gospel. There is no salvation. But we're going to look at uh, a short clip from an interview of, of uh, David Bentley Hart. He is one of these uh, people that have arisen in the church that are enemies of the cross of Christ, the enemies within the gates. So let me, I got to rewind that a little bit. There we go. So we're going to just uh, uh, about two minutes of this clip. You talked a little bit earlier about, because um, this is one of the things that I love so much about the book in general is how it forces us to reflect differently on, on, what, on what different words mean, uh, what, you know, we assume what they mean. And obviously hell is one of those words, but something else I thought was really important about the book, even if it's not a direct aim, and of course as a person who largely does live a lot of my life in more or less kind of Protestant spaces. Okay, one thing I can already tell from just what the interviewer said that uh, uh, David Bentley Hart is one of these guys that, well, like John Piper, likes to 
twist your understanding of words. Redefine terms. If you can, if you control the definition of words, you control what people believe. Oh, yeah, that that that's going on in culture today, isn't it? Like male and female, gender. If you can control a marriage, marriage. If you can control what the definition of the word means, you control the people that that use those words. Is the way that you deal with atonement in particular, because to me, these things are all so connected, how we think about sure. judgment, how we think about hell, how we think about the cross. And, That's true. And um, so for me, especially, you know, in a context where a lot of people that I know still very much believe in some version of sort of uh, penal substitutionary atonement, that section also. Now, 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 did you hear that? A lot of people I know still believe in penal substitutionary atonement. Yeah, and... Uh, uh, Greider, the, the Nazarene theologian professor, laments the fact that many Nazarenes still hold to the biblical gospel. That tells you what kind of a person is that that laments the fact that people still believe the biblical gospel. tells you what they are. The very fact that they, they hate it. See, it's obvious in Greider's book. He actually, de he detests penal substitutionary, uh, substitutionary atonement, and that's why he keeps slapping the label Calvinist on it, when it's not Calvinist at all. Calvinists believe it. <laughs> and so do all Orthodox Christians. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. You do not believe in Christ. You're outside the invisible church, the true church. You're not a believer. So it felt really, really critical. It's strange, isn't it? Because it's absent. This is Hart speaking now. Absolutely absent from the New Testament. I mean, yeah, he said, this is strange because penal substitutionary atonement is totally absent from the New Testament. I mean, there's a sort of way you read it in, and then 16th century translators wrote it in, in a sense. Oh, yeah, the 16th century translators. Well, we can go back and look at the Greek. Would that help? <laughs> like the word hooper or hooper. On behalf of. Christ died on behalf of sinners. In their place. Then, of course, there's, there's the... Well, what about the entire law of Moses and animal sacrifices? What What is that all about? Just God slaughtering animals? And and, and the, the idea that's expressed of, of the sacrifice was a, was a, uh, a pleasing or a propitiating, in some cases, aroma, and that caused God to, to stop his judgment. What's that all about? That's a story that's pointing to Christ. His preparatory instruction for Israel to receive Christ and what he does on the cross when it occurs. Isn't it? <laughs> So, so God, so God's a liar. So, why was God pleased with the sacrifices of Abel, but not of Cain? Go back. We're going, we're all the way back at the beginning of Genesis, aren't we? Yeah. Why? Why did God receive the offerings of Abel? offered an animal, a, de a sacrificed an animal, and rejected the, the, the farm produce, the, the vegetables or whatever they were, fruits, of Cain.
several reasons. But one points to Christ, and the other is the work of man's hands, the labor of Cain. God does not accept our deeds. They can't propitiate sin. Only God can propitiate sin because it's an offense against him. Sin is not an abstract thing. It's a crime against God. In how they chose to translate certain words. But I don't know. See, this is like all these, all these enemies of Christ. They always disparage the scripture and sow doubt. It's well, it's a problem with the they translated, they deliberately distort it. Well, I know enough about the original languages I can look at it and say, no, they didn't. Here and there, yeah, I, I see things now and then. Why do they translate it that way? And it's pretty obvious that, that their pre existing beliefs affected it. However, they haven't corrupted the meaning sufficiently to get it wrong. It's all through the New Testament and the Old. No, no, it wasn't such of, of a magnitude that it, it destroys the gospel. Now, the later translations, not the 16th century translators, it's the 20th and the 21st century translators that utterly corrupt the scriptures with their, with their paraphrases, like the NLT and the NIV. And the uh, NIV is probably the, the, you know, the paraphrases that's on the conservative side, but then you get the NLT, which is just no... And then you've got things like the Passion Bible and the Message Bible and these designer Bibles that are designed for by Satan for his children. Because that's all they are. Here, I've got a special Bible for you that won't bother you because the Holy Spirit can't use it to convict you of your sin because it's not God's Word. That's why they're popular. They're not God's Word. That's why people would rather read all kinds of books than the Bible, rather than the Bible because they're not God's Word. So that won't convict you of your sin. It has no authority. That's why people love, so that's, I think that's why people are so in love with theology because it's not God's Word. It has no authority except what man ascribes to it. So, you know, you could disagree with it, have a different opinion, but when it comes to the cross, you cannot have a different opinion. You can't. You can't. It, it, it's free for, like Roger Olson. Unlike Grider, he does not utterly reject and condemn penal substitutionary time. He knows very well Wesley held to it, and he's a Wesleyan Arminian. I don't know what Grider is then. But, of course, this book is really an apology for, for Arminianism, too. It says, well, not all Arminians are, uh, deny penal substitutionary atonement. And that's true. Thank God for that. Otherwise, they'd all go to hell. But uh, Roger Olson says he prefers, as if it's a matter of personal preference, the, the, uh, uh, the governmental hypotheses of the atonement. It's not a theory at all because it doesn't have any biblical evidence. It's an abomination. You don't get to choose an abomination. You don't get to disparage the blood of Jesus Christ because of personal preference without being judged by God for it. So, you know, uh, uh, Roger Olson can come across as a very mild-mannered guy, you know, like Michael Horton, too. He had a debate uh, Calvinism versus anti-Calvinism with and some of these guys it's not that Calvinism isn't the issue that was a wrong debate the debate should have been on the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ there's no room for for peacefulness on that issue it's a, it's a sin 
in the sight of God to be, uh, they're his enemies. Who was the king in the Old Testament that God rebuked? King of Judah I went up to fight with the king of Israel, and God rebuked him, saying, Why are you giving aid and comfort to my enemies? So, you know, uh, being nice and kind and everything else to, especially to teachers, false teachers, not talking about deluded Christians. They need to be instructed. But, you know, these nice teddy bear looking, now, by the way, uh, David Bentley Hart doesn't look like this anymore. Now that he's been, you know, th this is like an Anglican look. Now, now he's thoroughly amissed in uh, uh, orthodoxy, so he looks like he, he has the, the long, scraggly beard and stuff. I don't know what to think about Anglicanism or uh, uh, orthodoxy. The only thing about orthodoxy is vague enough you might be able to actually believe the gospel in it. It's not a dogmatic system, uh, from what I can tell, like uh, Roman Catholicism. Although with Pope Francis in there, you know, like anything goes. I mean, if you can bring Pachamama idols into St. Peter's, what can't you do? I bet what you can't do is preach the gospel and call it the truth and the exclusive truth. Here, how about this for a message for Catholic priests to preach? I think there's some that will preach this. I encourage you, demonstrate you're a true Christian. Preach the message, Pope Francis is going to hell. Because that's true, unless he repents. Unless God grants him repentance. Otherwise, he won't. Well, let's go back to another heretic. This is heresy. This is damnable, damnable heresy. I got the wrong screen. No, I mean, there's no good, I mean, seriously, no good New Testament scholar with who really understands uh, the culture and the languages of the time and of the texts who for a moment... He's talking about N.T. Wright, the culture and the languages and times. In other words, see, what these these people do, it's that they put it on a level, like, unless you're one of these scholars, you can't possibly know what the Bible means. Well, actually, one thing nice about the Westminster Confession of Faith, it says the Bible is perspicuous, which means that you can understand it. You can understand it. You don't need to be a scholar. Believes that that theology is found in Paul or in the Gospels or in so. So no good, no good theologian that's familiar with the language and the history of the times believes that penal substitutionary atonement is found in the writings of Paul. That's that's the crap that's called the. Uh, NPP, the, uh, the New Perspective on Paul. And N.T. Wright is the most widely known advocate of that. And he's a devil. A very, it, see, the scripture says, warns us that, that Satan appears as a, an angel of light, and so does his, his, his messengers, like uh, N.T. Wright. See, N.T. Wright wrote a book uh, affirming the, the actual resurrection of Jesus. So all the conservatives say, oh, he's a friend of ours. And then he comes around with, along with this very vague, amorphous, amorphous view, this new perspective on Paul, that says Paul didn't mean what the church has understood him to mean for 2,000 years. Let me, N.T. Wright, open your eyes. Does that sound like Jesus Christ, or does it sound like the devil? Here, let me help you. God didn't, you know, God, God when he told you not to eat of that fruit, 
he, he did it because he wanted to keep something good from you. Because he knows that if you eat it, your eyes will be opened. Yeah, if you eat N.T. Wright's fruit or David Bentley Hart's fruit, your eyes will be opened. <sighs> but not to the truth. You'll be a convert. Disciple of these things. The other, other writings of the New Testament. But even if it were found there, but even if it were found there, it's not found there, but even if it were. Could one, you know, could one believe it? I, 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 I mean. Uh, so, so even if the Bible clearly states this, could one believe it? <clears throat> now, now, didn't Roger Olson say something like that? Uh, uh, James White, an item or something, he said something like, like uh, well, I can't remember what was that in the re regard to. But but even if if this was true, I would go seeking a different God. <laughs> I'll have to dig that quote up somewhere. So in other words, because the God of, that reveals Himself in the Scripture is not to my liking. If that if this is a real God, the God that 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 does things like this, like penal substitutionary atonement that does election, things like that, that actually perhaps might not actually save all people. Well, I don't want to believe in a God like that. I'm going to go find a God I can believe in that suits my preferences. <laughs> Satan will give you one. You know, how many different religions has he created in the world? Look at all the Christian denominations. How many of them consistently preach Christ and Christ crucified? Even if they claim they do. Having attended a lot of different churches, visited a lot of different churches, when do I... Hearing Christ and Christ crucified is a rare experience. Oh, they might get to it to once in a while, but not often enough that if you walk in off the street, you'd hear it. The odds are pretty low. Feel them almost as often as you hear truth come out of the mouth of the President of the United States. Uh, why would one believe it? I mean, it's a very strange belief, isn't it? So why would you believe it? Even if the, Christ, the Scripture teaches this, why would you believe it? Because it's a very strange belief. How can the, the Orthodox even not see? That's why they're pretty squishy, obviously, because if David Bentley Hart can be an Orthodox Christian, Orthodox as in the denomination, the sort of the denomination, I don't know which brand. See, these are generally state churches, too. You've got the Russian Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, the... Whatever there, uh, every every country is. I think they've got like seven different autonomous things or something. It's it's complicated. That God uh, is outraged at us for the sins committed by someone else that is a, a distant parent even before we then also okay so God is outraged at us because the sins Adam committed well actually the scripture says that everyone will be condemned for their own sin so you, he's taking Augustine's doctrine of original guilt now <clears throat> So God imputes the guilt of Adam, the sin of Adam, to us. That is not biblical. That comes from theology, from Augustine and Calvin and Luther. Imputed original guilt. No, the problem is you're born without God. You are conceived in sin. Not the, because sin, sex is a sinful act. 
No, that Augustine believed that. Yeah, there's Augustine a lot of problems. Uh, no, because you're conce- you're born of Adam, and Adam is spiritually dead. We are born into this world in Adam. When he died, he took the race with him because he was the race. So we were created to be the image of God. You cannot, the temples of God, you cannot be that unless God is in you. And Adam, when he rebelled against God, he cut himself off from God. That is what death is. And became the, the, the presence of God in him was gone. So you have a, an empty temple with, with a God that it's supposed to house no longer there. So we're coming, we come into the world in that state. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. God must dwell in you. Or as Paul says, um, Christ in us, the hope of glory. See, it's not just a matter of of giving mental assent. God has to do something. He has to regenerate you. He has to put his spirit in you. He has to make you a new creation. Otherwise, you're not saved. It's not just a matter of believing a certain handful of doctrines. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus onto good works. God's works. He is at work in us both to will and to do his good pleasure in those who truly belong to him. Now, this man doesn't belong to him because he denies what Christ did. I mean, (laughs) obviously. He's of his father, the devil, because Jesus said he was a liar from the beginning. When the Satan lies, he lies out of his own nature. His children do the same thing. earn his outrage with sins we couldn't have avoided because we're corrupted by that distant fact. The scripture does say God has shut all of humanity under sin. Shut us up under sin because of Adam. For a purpose, in order that he might show mercy on all. In other words, if if it wasn't that way, those who worked the hardest at pursuing God might be saved. But the rest of us poor devils, we're just going to hell out of laziness or something. Is that applicable to the holiness movement? Perhaps. Perhaps. Because the holiness movement is all about man-made holiness. The American Holiness Code. No drinking, no smoking, no movies, no dancing, no no fun. <laughs> no 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 women cannot have a wedding band on their finger if it's gold. I wonder if they're okay with titanium. I mean I've heard Nazarene's Nazarene preacher and his wife complaining about this stuff. Old school Nazarene. Old school. He's complaining how far down the Nazarenes were at that time. But then then I remember his wife saying how difficult it was for her to take her wedding ring off. Total misunderstanding of Scripture. Well, I have to say, I I saw that too in Grider's book. uh, That he has absolutely no comprehension of Scripture. I mean, he, he just... And that's what I've been hearing at the Nazarene church I've been attending. Uh, the pastor does not have any real comprehension of Scripture. He, he always ends up with a weird twist on it, at least for me, which has been part of the reason my concern has been growing about what I'm not hearing there and what I am hearing there. It's like the Jesus washing his disciples' feet got translated into uh, Jesus Christ came into the world to serve us. 
And I hear that consistently. Talks about the Holy Spirit come and minister to us. Like God is our servant. Really? I think somebody's got things a little backwards. Christ came into the world not to serve us, but to serve the Father. The Father sent him. The one who sends you is the one you serve. Christ submitted himself. His obedience was to the Father, not to us. Peter said, no, far be it from you that you should die on that cross. And what, what was uh, what was Jesus' answer to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. Okay, we're almost done with this guy. And the way in which God, the loving God, uh, has has made it possible for some of us to be elected for forgiveness is through the violent murder of an innocent victim uh, that somehow will satiate his wrath against sin. If you think about it... The- See, that, that is so common among atheists. Let me get this guy off the screen. Who hung on the cross? An innocent victim? I mean, innocent as in on interest, just a bystander? God just g- grabbed a bystander off the street that hadn't committed sin and nailed him to the cross for us? Or like Jehovah's Witnesses, oh, God sent Michael the archangel uh, to become a man, and then he nailed Michael the archangel to the cross. Huh? Who was the offended party? How, how would killing Michael or anybody else remove the offense? I mean, the wages of sin is death. So you, you either die for your sins or God must somehow find a way to satisfy his justice so he might be both just and the justifier of you, the sinner. That's the cross. And who hung on the cross? God the Son. The man, Jesus Christ. I mean, it wasn't his deity. I mean, he was the flesh, his body. His body died. (sighs) But see, it's a total slander. And people eat this stuff up because they, they hate the gospel, they hate Christ. And Jesus said to his disciples, if they hated me, they'll hate you also. They hate us. So uh, let's look at some scripture, just a few. <laughs> I mean, there's so many. But let's let's go to, uh, let's see. Let's, here, uh, Romans, let's go to Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 6. So Now, now remember, he said, uh, the New Testament knows nothing of penal substitutionary atonement. For while we were still helpless, still in our sins, in our unbelief, in our darkness, at the right time, he's talking about the big picture here, talking about humanity. At the right time, Christ died for the righteous? No, for the ungodly, the ungodly. impious for prostitutes and tax collectors and even pastors. The ungodly, well, Jesus said who? You know, Jesus was criticized for eating with with, uh, tax collectors and prostitutes. And he said what? It's not the healthy that need a physician, but the, uh, the, the sick. Christ came to save sinners. He didn't came, came, uh, come to save the righteous. 
So the, the thing is, if you believe you're righteous because of your deeds, well, you, you're not going to be saved because you don't trust in Christ. You don't. You don't think you need him. People like William or uh, David Bentley Hart. You don't need a sacrifice for your sins. So you don't have one. It's through faith. Christ's sacrifice avails you nothing if you don't believe, if you don't trust in him and what he did. Verse 7, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man and someone would even dare uh, would dare even to die but in contrast to that you know, maybe perhaps someone would give his life for a for a good man a, tri a truly righteous man you know would dare even to do that but in contrast to that god demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, let me work de now. The word demonstrates here uh, is not simply a demonstration, but it means it commends or, or sets forth. It's a present presents his love in this fact, in this act. God is displaying his love. It's not. I don't want to use the word demonstration because that's used by by uh, the uh, uh, governmental crowd that God demonstrated Christ's death was a demonstration of his of his hatred towards sin really but not an atoning sacrifice no no it's just a demonstration that God takes sin seriously as I mentioned before I think the global flood was sufficient I think uh, God's demonstration of his anger against those who engage in strange uh, uh, sexual practices at Sodom and Gomorrah was sufficient. I would say the fact that every human being dies is sufficient. So no, but but uh, executing an innocent, a truly innocent man, oh, that'll somehow prove that God takes sin seriously. Exactly how would that make that point clear? It's like, huh? How does that? that? That's asinine. That whole, it's not a theory because it has no biblical evidence. It is a, a man-made substitute for the truth. It's a doctrine of demons. The governmental theory is a doctrine of demons. I would say also the one of, of uh, God, Jesus paid a ransom to the devil would be up in that same category as a doctrine of demons. No, Satan has no rights. Criminals have no rights. Satan is a criminal, a rebel against God. Rebels don't have rights. God demonstrates, displays. It's not just a, a, a demonstration on somebody else. In his own being. Now let's remember, God took on humanity. The Son became flesh. And there's, I mean, there, this is a difficult thing to, to talk about without somebody. Somebody's going to say, yeah, you're wrong. Blah, blah, blah. Then you explain it better. If he purchased the church with his own blood, God, then God, because God is all, both the, is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was on the cross in a human body dying for the sins of the world reconciling the world to himself. Taking sin out of the way that he might manifest his love and mercy and grace. Having appeased his justice, he had to satisfy himself because justice and love are both things that God is. 
which Grider denies. Kenneth Grider, the, the Nazarene theologian slash heretic, denies that God is love and God is just as far as part of the attributes of God. What he is in his nature. His phusis. Just as much as he is God. <clears throat> he demonstrates his own love toward us. So this is a manifestation of his love in that while we were yet sinners, still his enemies, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. See, justification, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Or from the wrath, let me put it this way. I see that of God there is in italics, because it's not in the text. From the wrath, well, the wrath of, well, the, the, the law is what was appeased, too, because the law is the justice of God. <clears throat> the law had to be taken off the table, so, so to speak, uh, because God had said the wages of sin is death, and, and those that do not keep all the commandments of this law shall die. So that had to be removed, appeased, satisfied. As Jesus said, I think now I've come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So not only Jesus had to fulfill the obedience necessary under the law because he was born under the law, but he also had to fulfill the punishment of the law in order for to save us. See, this is these people who deny penal substitutionary atonement have denied all the Bible. It doesn't make sense anymore. And Grider, out of autonomous free will, God chooses to love, according to him. Or chooses to see God can forgive. Grider does not believe forgiveness is forgiveness if God pays the penalty. This man is a fool. Well, he's a he's dead now. Her, he's a dead heretic. Because he's he's denied the testimony of Scripture. He's one of these people that doesn't like what the Bible says, so he goes off and says his own thing and teaches it to others. See, that's a, the you know remember the warning of James says, "Let not many of you become teachers, brethren." Because we'll be judged more strictly. For we all do err in many things. Yeah. So you go off teaching people errors, contradicting the word of God. Uh, you've got a harsher judgment coming for you. So don't become a teacher unless you have to. In other words, because God requires it of you. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath, from the wrath through him. Now you get the wrath of the law, the wrath of justice. Um, so that's of God. It's of God is not improper, but people have certain pre-existing ideas of certain things. For if while we were enemies enemies of God. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Okay, this is while we're still enemies. It's not us reconciling ourselves. It's God reconciled us to himself by satisfying his justice. He That was the obstacle between God and man. God's justice, not God's love, not God's grace, God's, not God's mercy, his justice. Now we're talking all these things are God. So but this this is it, it was 
our sin was a barrier to God that prevented him from treating us as his children, for prevented his actively loving us other than disciplining us. Of course, discipline is love, but it was a barrier to God. It, God was the, the enmity between God and man existed because of sin. And it worked both ways. It wasn't just because we didn't love God and God loved us. God is righteous and holy. He himself was the barrier that prevented him from treating us as if we hadn't sinned. His very nature. That's why Grider, I believe, rejects the idea that God is righteous in his nature because that means God has something in him that must be satisfied for him to deal with us in terms of mercy and grace. God had to satisfy himself. First of all, having been justified, declared just, because God did it. See, this is why you can have universal atonement, but not universal salvation, because Paul's making a distinction. Justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him, through Christ, who died for us on our behalf. Now, remember in chapter 10 of Romans, when Paul's talking about salvation, what does he say? He says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as Lord, the copulative in the Greek is generally omitted, especially by Paul. So if somebody says the word, uh, or Jesus is Lord, that word is isn't there, just they don't know what they're talking about. It Truly, it's not there, but it's implied. That's the way Greek works. You don't have to put it in there, in those things. So, uh, Jesus is Lord. It's a confession of, you know, the eyes, oh, we confess the Lord Jesus. Because the, the, uh, there's people out there, the, the free grace movement, the antinomian movement, uh, or the, the, the godless movement, what what they are the ones that say, well, I said a prayer, therefore I'm saved, and that's what the preacher said, so I'm going to believe the preacher. You know, that uh, that that's not. They 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 are so, they think that anything everything is works, so they try to minimize works to the absolute minimum, which is not having a faith that doesn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, So that's why uh, it's a problem. But uh, <clears throat> but th that's why they don't like, they, they like the King James, confess the Lord Jesus. Well, it doesn't make a difference. It's confess him as in what sense? That he existed? <laughs> that doesn't save you. You've got to confess him as Lord. Jesus is Lord. He's my Lord. You're identifying yourself with him. Not just giving assent to a to a doctrine that you don't actually live out. Remember, at that time, to confess Jesus as Lord um, caused a lot of the world to be your enemy. The Jews would be your enemy because you confessed that he was the Messiah and God. Remember when Jesus said that before Abraham was, I am, what did the Jews do? They picked up stones to stone him with, didn't they? They knew exactly what he meant. He was claiming to be God. Before Abraham was, I am, is an expression of deity, that you are God. And that's why they picked up stones. They knew exactly what he said, and he said, oh, you don't understand. No, he didn't say that, did he? They understood him correctly. And when he said, uh, for what for what are you stoning me? For what? 
and they, and they said, uh, because you being a man make yourself out to be God. Because he was. Oh, Jesus never called himself God. Yes, he did. The Jews certainly thought he did. See, these people just don't want to believe the Bible. They're blinded by Satan. And they can't see it. See, I'm sure uh, uh, David Hart, Bentley Hart, when he reads the Bible, he actually doesn't see this, uh, this, uh, the substitutionary atonement because he doesn't want to see it and because the devil's blinded his mind, his eyes, so he cannot see it because he doesn't love the truth. He hasn't received the love of the truth. Salvation is a gift from God. And if you don't receive that gift, well, you don't have it. It's not something you can simply, I choose to be saved. No. If God calls you, you can respond, but you cannot just simply choose to be saved. You won't even want to do it. It's like Bentley, a David Hart there. He's, he's rejecting Christ. He despises Christ because Christ did die for our sins on the cross. He's rejecting what Jesus did because he, don't li he doesn't like it. To call him a Christian is an abomination. <clears throat> so in Romans chapter 10, he says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, well, a whole lot of stuff is in these two statements, by the way. All the things that lie behind this is just condensed down to the very concise form. You shall be saved. Why? Because with the mouth, with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. You're justified by faith. So justification precedes salvation. And I'll show you. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So you're justified by believing that Christ, who he is, and that he died for your sins and rose from the dead, which is necessary, is necessarily means you believe that he actually atoned for your sins, if you understand anything. Now, he's talking to a population that was steeped or knew Judaism. That they weren't, they weren't corrupted by all the weird stuff that's been uh, accreted onto Christianity in the last two thousand years. But the uh, the first, you're justified through faith, and then by confessing Christ, he says, by identifying yourself with Christ. You, you do that onto baptism, or onto baptism, onto salvation. Baptism is a God-ordained means, although I don't think it's exclusively the only means, of confessing Christ. You are, in a at least semi-public way, before others, before witnesses, before the church, identifying yourself with Christ. Now, Paul doesn't talk about baptism there, but baptism is that, at least believer's baptism, which is what we see in the New Testament. But the, the thing that saves you, again, it's, it's you're justified by believing and then by uh, openly identifying yourself with, but with Christ, public confession in some way, you, uh, you are, uh, do that unto salvation. You are identifying yourself. You believe the truth of, God, of the gospel, and then you identify yourself with Christ by confession, by the, with the mouth. So we see that, that, that in there, the same things Paul's saying here, that that having been justified by his blood, what Christ did on the cross, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. If you're not in Christ, 
His justification doesn't save you. There's a distinction. Again, this goes back to how you can have a universal atonement and not a universal salvation. The justification takes the barrier of sin and God's righteousness uh, by justifying us through the cross, that barrier is removed so God can treat us with grace and mercy. Without that, he can't. He has to satisfy himself. He has to satisfy his nature. A lot of people don't understand it. They don't understand a lot of things because they don't want to bother to try to understand. It's not like there's this head. See, if, if a person goes to God and says, God, I don't understand, teach me. He will. Say, open your Bible. I'll show you. He will. He'll lead you through the scriptures. He will show you. He will reveal it to you. He will help you to understand. But people, I don't like that idea. See, the problem is like uh, like David Bentley Hart and, and Grider and Roger Olson, I'd have to say too. It's not that they don't understand the truth about penal substitutionary atonement. They don't like it. It's, it's why uh, a Grider in particular, and I saw Bentley, uh, you said David Bentley Hart was doing the same thing. They like to slap the label Calvinist on it uh, to just poison the whole discussion because Calvinist, Calvinism carries some baggage that is toxic. It does. There's, there's some ideas in it that are simply toxic to most people, including most Christians, <laughs> including me. The, uh, the, the, the absolute eternal decree of absolutely everything is toxic. And the Bible does not teach it. So Satan manages to inject his poison into things. He doesn't have to, uh, the whole thing doesn't have to be poison. It's like rat poison. If you look at the ingredients, it's like 99.98% or 95%. Uh, inert ingredients, in other words, food. And it's like that that point uh, zero five percent or something is the strychnine that kills, causes you to bleed to death. Just a very small amount kills the mice and rats that eat it thinking it's food. Because it, it, oh, it smells good, tastes good. That, that's like David Bentley Hart or N.T. Wright or Roger Olson or uh, Kenneth Grider. Oh, yeah, I like that. Because what? Because the cross offends our flesh. Let's, uh, where, where is that? Uh, I think it's in First Corinthians, first chapter, First Corinthians. But let's, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Let Let's go here. First Corinthians. Oh, excuse me. Not that I really have to apologize for, for having a cold, I guess. That's a little silly, isn't it? Some of our customs are so silly. Now, my co if I break out into co coughing spasm, yeah, it's like you don't really need to endure that, do you? <clears throat> well, you can suffer with me. <laughs> That's not really vicarious, though. It doesn't make the cold go away. For Christ, uh, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize. You know, all these uh, groups that say you can't be saved without water baptism. Why didn't Paul think it was so utterly important? A little inconsistency there. A church of the Christ. 
they believe, some of them believe that you're not baptized in a church of Christ. In fact, typically, traditional ones would say, if you're not baptized for the forgiveness of sins, using uh, Acts chapter 3, well, that's not what it says. It says, not ba baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins is in Christ. It's not in baptism. These people don't understand anything. The church over the millennium, a lot of the people, you know, they're carnal-minded. People cannot see the, the, the things of the Spirit. They're foolishness to them. And this is an example right here. For Christ did not send me to baptize. And Corinth was an absolute mess. I hate preaching through Corinthians. The church is such a mess. You know, it's, it's not... Oh, there's a whole lot better things than like Ephesians and Philippians, Corinth, mess. For, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Why? Because it is through the hearing of the gospel that salvation comes. We have to believe it. You don't you have to you have to know what the gospel is. You have to hear the message in order to receive it. But to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, in rhetoric and oratorial skills. That the cross of Christ should be made void. In other words, uh, Paul wanted to make it a, a he did not try to make the message pleasing to the flesh, his, his oratory pleasing to the flesh. But rather, you know, he, he said, my speech is contemptible, because that's the way God wanted it, in order that it might be the power of God. That the Christ would not be made, the cross should not be made void. The cross, the gospel, the power of the gospel saves people, not man's ability to massage and make the message attractive. Now, if you, do you notice that uh, in Christianity today, almost nobody believes this? The whole seeker sensitive movement is a denial that it is God who saves. It's making it making the gospel attractive to, to human beings. A Rick Warren, that's all he does. Joel Osteen. Of course, neither of them actually get around to the gospel because they don't know what it is. But it's making the message attractive. Christianity, totally gutted of all its content, attra uh, attractive to man. You know, you can bring people to, you want to bring people to a church? It's really easy. Just put a sign out, Sunday morning, free food and beer. You'll get a crowd. So? To what end? It's the same thing about uh, Joel Osteen. To what end? He can fill a, a sports arena. Every Sunday morning, plus millions and millions and millions around the world on video and television. To what end, other than they worship Joel Osteen? Has nothing to do with Christ crucified. Has nothing to do with salvation. It's all about be what you can be. Fle pleasing the flesh. Rick Warren, the same way. The whole seeker-sensitive movement the same way. They took the cross out of the buildings because they knew it was offensive to the flesh. They knew it was offensive to sinners. Because what does the cross say? That the Son of God had to die because of your sinfulness. And they don't want to hear that. That you could not have a relationship with God apart from Jesus Christ his son dying on that tree, on that wooden cross. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. So people like uh, Kenneth Grider, 
the Nazarene theologian, and David Bentley Hart, the somehow philosopher or theologian uh, doing his own thing, more or less, the, the people that disparage the cross, that's what they're doing. If, if you disparage penal substitutionary atonement, you are denying the cross. Because that's what it's all about. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing. In other words, those people are dying. They're going to hell. So you can look at William, uh, David Bentley Hart, if you run into him, and say, Sir, because of your message, I know that in your current state, if you continue this way, you are surely going to hell because the Bible says that the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. And you hate what the cross actually means. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Yes, Christians love the true message of the cross. The world hates it. And when preacher wants, uh, preachers want to get the cross out of the church, or they don't preach on the cross, the cross isn't central the, to the gospel, the gospel's not central, they are perishing. Preacher's up there every Sunday giving his own message, saying what he wants to think about how to have a happier marriage, how to get a better, get ahead on your job, uh, all kinds of stuff. And it's not, there's a, the cross and Christ is not kept central is because they don't love Jesus and the cross, which indicates they're probably going to hell. Because the cross is foolishness to them. If they believed it, if they believe, understood what it truly is and how it's necessary all the time in our lives, that it is our salvation, Christ on crucified is our salvation, not just a one-time thing. Oh, you've, I, I believe, therefore I don't have to worry about that. Now I can go on to, to more important things like how to have a better marriage. So you say, oh, we're going to do a, an eight-part series in, in bedroom enhancement. There's past pastors that have done that. You know, the uh, whole sermon series on, on sex. Where are they going to hell? Not because sex is sinful at all, especially in the marital bed. Is that, but preaching that, you know, making that a big deal and, and minimizing the cross indicates that preacher is not saved. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Most preachers apparently don't believe that. because From my experience, because I seldom ever hear the cross preached. Seldom. It's like, oh, that's just old stale stuff. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, yeah, these philosophers, these, these theologians, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Yeah. <laughs> For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, you cannot come to know God through philosophy. You can't. God said, no, you can't. God was pleased, was well pleased, through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Well, see, here too, it requires the power of God for you to believe. It's not some special property in you. It's a gift from God. Repentance and faith are gifts from God. And I cannot explain the dynamic of salvation. You know, it's a, whether it's simply a God just bang, 
But no, because the preaching, of the, the hearing of the gospel is necessary. You know, there's some uh, like primitive Baptists and some of the, the Baptist cults that believe that, no, you don't have to hear the gospel. God just arbitrarily zaps people. Regenerates people randomly. No, no connection with the gospel. Well, that, that is really Calvinism. God, those are truly hyper-Calvinists. Well, Calvin, Calvin would have just tossed them out of Geneva or threw them in prison. So. By the way, if you look at Calvin's own writings, it, it appears that he did hold to a universal uh, view of the atonement, by the way. He certainly did not teach uh, uh, limited atonement. Did not. You can't find it. <laughs> not that he's entirely consistent. I mean, that's the criticism. Well, it's not really consistent. Well, that's not true. Maybe he just actually understood it better than his followers. But uh, again, God's just the, the, the barrier of sin was between humanity and God. So you really have uh, and, and God's own righteousness. God had to satisfy his righteousness, his law, his justice, in order to treat sinners uh, in a way other than giving them their just deserts, which is hell, which is death, which is destruction. That's what the cross is about. It's not about God giving you what you deserve. It's about God not giving you what you deserve. And what, that's what grace is. You getting not what you deserve, but what you don't deserve, which is God's mercy and grace, eternal life. So God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached. Now, some will say the foolishness of preaching, the, the translations. No, uh, a translation. Uh, King James puts it that way. I wonder if the New King James corrects that. Because that's one of those things that does need to be clarified. Uh huh. Yeah, the New King James corrected that too. Through the foolishness of the message preached, all you King James onlyness people. No, their King James can be improved. Uh, now, this is one of the, the, they were not perfect, and they were not actually original translators most of the time. So, uh, Now, ESV, the, the, ESV just paraphrases here, so. Young's literal does see it's it's does foolishness of preaching, but it is it is a foolishness of preaching, not the f preaching in general. It's a foolishness of preaching a particular thing, the message. It's the foolishness of the message of the cross. Some preach, most preaching is just plain foolishness. That doesn't help. There is no merit in preaching foolishness. You never know. Somebody's probably teaching that someplace. What what do we see here? For indeed the Jews ask for signs, attesting miracles. Remember what they're always asking Jesus, do a sign for us, do a sign for us. Herod said, Give me a sign. I want something to, to, to demonstrate that you're you have authority. And the Greeks search for wisdom, philosophy, the love of wisdom. That's what philosophia is. Loving wisdom. And to the, uh, but we preach Christ crucified. Well, Paul did. Really hard to find that today, though. Show me that I, I know one church that consistently preached Christ crucified. And so. Uh, uh, an, an LCMS church, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Now, 
it, it is a little culture shock, but, you know, I might end up having to attend there. I don't think they'd let me join, but they, they are sectarian. Uh, but I, I talked to the pastor, and like we had a really fun discussion. I mean, he knows the Bible well. I believe he's born again because we're going back and forth on things, and you know. But you'd say, but the scripture says this, but it also says this, you know. And uh, but because he doesn't have the, he's not the. I don't think he has the authority to say. I, I think the problem is that I couldn't probably take communion there, that they're close communion. <clears throat> but that means that probably nobody else could either. I think that's sinful, and I'll publicly state that too. I'll do a video on that, at least one, the sinfulness of close communion. How dare you deny the Lord's table to his people? It's not your table, it's his. Yeah, the scripture actually says, let everyone examine themselves. Uh, the denomination, the LCMS denomination, is an error on that. I'm sure it's not the only error they have. I'm sure somebody can find lots of errors that I have, too, now here and there. But if I, if I knew they were errors, I'd fix them. <clears throat> Show me the truth. I love the truth. But we preach Christ crucified. The Jews want signs. The Greeks want wisdom, philosophy. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block. The idea of a crucified Messiah is anathema to them because the Scripture says that all who hang on a tree, and that's what the cross is, it's made out of a tree, wood, are cursed. But what they don't get is Christ became accursed for us. And to the Gentiles, foolishness. Yeah, it's foolish. Uh, David Bentley Hart, the cross is foolish. The idea that, that, that Jesus died for our sins is foolish. Same about uh, uh, Kenneth Grider, the Nazarene. Foolish. He thinks uh, it's, uh, the substitutionary atonement is foolish. It's all over the place. The Gentiles' foolishness are Gentiles. But to those who are the called, called by God, both Jews and Greeks. Apparently, God doesn't call everybody, huh? There's a call. Now, now Calvinists talk about, and I think maybe the Lutherans would too, and I think maybe the Catholics do. The Catholics talk about the elect as being something. There's almost like there's. The elect believers and the non-elect believers, like you can be saved without being elect. Elect means chosen. That's all it means. Elected by God, chosen by God. But, uh, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, God has to call you, period. You can't call yourself. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Yeah, we know that. We understand the cross. We are amazed by it. People that aren't, I think they're not saved. That's what Paul's saying here. But to those who are called, or they're not the called, they are not uh, who are ca the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ crucified, as we're talking about the cross. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, wiser than David Bentley Hart, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things. Ah, oh, so God does choose on a particular basis, not randomly, the foolish things of the world to shame the wise and the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen and the things that are not that he might nullify the things that are that no man 
should boast before God. Yeah, God has chosen guys like me. Foolish, weak, not noble, not mighty. Why? Because his his glory is not as veiled in those things, too. It's like, yeah, we're vessels of clay filled with the glory of God. And no man should boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. It's God who saved me. It's God who led me in that direction. It's God who convicted me of my sins. And it's God who saved me with the message of the cross. The Holy Spirit. It probably, I'm sure I'd heard it, sort of. You might almost hear it in a Lutheran church, indirectly. It wasn't an LCMS church. Oh. But it was still... Uh, it, it, but it didn't mean anything until that moment and the, when the Holy Spirit opened my eyes and revealed to me that, indeed, Jesus Christ had died for all my sins, and because of his, what he did on the cross, I was right with God, period. Past, present, and future sins. He all bore them all on the cross. Woohoo! Wow, was that good news? Was that good news? Because that's not the understanding I'd gotten from going to church all my life. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Who has become to us. But you are in Christ Jesus, who has become to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen. Amen again. The battle... Christians are fighting among themselves over inconsequential things, like, is the atonement limited or universal? Well, there's a correct answer to that. But people's salvation don't depend on it, on your understanding of the extent of the atonement. Your salvation depends on whether or not you believe the atonement that Christ died for your sin. Because if you don't believe that, you're not believing in Christ. You're not in him. You're not saved. You're not justified. That's a problem. I wish some of these so-called apologists would, they seem to be going farther and farther from the central truths, but it's, you know, they, they want to argue things about the deity of Christ. But that's, you know, that's certainly important. But the deity of Christ is demonstrated by his resurrection, which is intimately tied to the cross. Muslims don't believe that Jesus died on the cross. They believe somebody else was nailed to the cross instead of him. They don't believe it. See, their Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And they don't believe in an atoning sacrifice. The, the last I heard, it's been many years now, but was that Jesus only paid for the sin of Adam. It's sort of an idea, I suppose, that takes uh, original sin or the imputed guilt of Adam, Augustine's crop, uh, crap doctrine. Uh, no, we're not. The idea that we were separate from Adam anyway is part of the misunderstanding that 
Uh, Adam was not just a representative. He was us. The entire human race was genetically present in him. He, it, we are just fragments of Adam. Think about it. Where'd you come from? Where'd you get your your DNA? Where did you get your 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 life from? You a separate creation of God? No, you're not. Not I mean not naturally. And even spiritually we are in Christ. He is the the second Adam. We are partakers of the divine nature in him. It is, a, it is more than simply believing doctrines. God, we are a new creation. And it's intimately connected to Christ. He is the firstborn of many brethren. So, uh, and, so don't listen to these, you know, don't get shook up by these, these, theologians and these philosophers that come along saying that, oh, the cross of Christ is nothing but foolishness. Just discard them as unbelievers because that's what they are. They are outside of Christ. They are enemies of the cross. They are the enemies within the church. And there's a lot of them. A lot of them. Entire denominations the majority of denominations, in fact, are enemies of the cross. Some of them are enemies simply because they tend to ignore it. Others actively oppose it. Either way, they're enemies of the cross. If Jesus Christ and Christ crucified is not in the foreground of our Sunday worship, why are we there? If the cross is not central, if Christ is not central, what are they, we there worshiping? Probably ourselves and the world or the preacher. If the preacher doesn't maintain Christ and Christ crucified as the overriding perpetual theme in the church. Who is he serving? Enemies not at the gates, but enemies within the gates.